flew JJ home. They're like, oh, where to bury him, you know? And his dad and I got talking. We wanted to keep him close to home. Since he was born and raised in Forkston, we decided to put him at rest up here at um, Forkston Cemetery. So it's only a half a mile away from my house and only about a mile, mile and a half away from his dad's. So I don't have to travel too far to visit him. I find myself often coming up here like in the middle of the night, one, two, three o'clock in the morning visiting. Just grateful that he's so close to the house. Wonderful little village of Forkston. He's somewhat up on the hill by himself, a little quiet time. It's peaceful. And we are here. Tell me, Lord, now won't you say, can you help me find my way? I'm tired, looking for my own. As she said, follow the mountain round to where the sky meets the ground, to the Wyoming Valley and PA. So I saddled up my horse and I gave a little we're losing more people to heroin overdoses than we are to motor vehicle accidents in this country. Um, I went to jail, I was on house arrest, I couldn't hold down a job. The media is talking more and more and more about it because more and more people are dying. Until we have the treatment in place, the programs in place for uh, for addiction. This is a disease. Until we have something in hand to help these individuals get through what they're suffering from, um, I don't know if we'll see an end to it. You know, they're in that emergency room, and the doctor or a nurse or someone says, yeah, "That's just another addict. That's just another junkie." Screaming from the shore. But it's somebody's family member, be a mother or father, son or daughter, brother, sister, aunt or uncle. It's been called the invisible problem. The overuse of prescription painkillers and their illicit counterparts are here, and the nation has been put on notice. We're back now with an urgent warning from the Surgeon General. He's sounding the alarm this week to doctors about the epidemic of opioid abuse in the U.S. Pat, the president is placing the spotlight on the drug addiction and the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic in the Bay Area is impacting hundreds of families across the Bay Area. Today, President Obama said that America's addiction to painkillers is as great a threat as terrorism. Small towns have been suddenly thrust into the spotlight as they have become the front line in America's newest battle with addiction. So I had a pretty big surgery when I was about, I'd say about 19 or 20. And um, I was on painkillers for a decent amount of time. And I started to like the feeling. And um, one thing led to another. And then it kind of started to escalate to, you know, snorting pills. Then, you know, then it started to increase to heroin. And that's kind of how it. What is what is um, what does it feel like when you take them? It's very, it's a very numbing effect. It's, I think, for many people, they use it to, you know, not feel, kind of, not have emotion, to kind of take all the pain and just put it underneath you. So. My first question is, have you seen an increase in treating clients who abuse opioids over the last couple of years? There's an incredible increase. 
you know, it seems like the uh, opioid abuse is rampant. Um, 2016 Time Magazine, uh, the October issue, notes that uh, the overdose rate of uh, between all drugs is gone up so much so that there's a 60% death rate of all drugs. 60% are opioid related. Of that 60%, the highest rate is because of prescription medications. So yes, it's definitely on an increase and it's definitely, and all the articles you read say the opioid epidemic and it is an epidemic. Right there. All right, so we're pulling up here. Let me just kill this. All right, so we're going to interview. All right, one more. Two, three. Hello, babe. This is worth Yeah. Who in that chest will free? Stars that shine bright at night. No one gets me feeling Hi. Hi. Hi, Kenny. Nice to meet you. Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hey, nice Come to meet you. Guys. My son, JJ. Um, he was a awesome boy, um, typical boy. Um, liked to ride on his four wheelers and go mud bogging and loved snowboarding and skateboarding. I mean, he just loved everything that a boy would typically do. Sadly, that came to an end when he was 17 years old. Um, he took the road to drugs. Um, he hid it so well from the family. And in 2011, he came to me with the words, Mom, I'm a heroin addict and I need help. It's one of my favorite pictures when he was a baby anyway. Then he started growing up. Can you take a step back? That's his preschool right picture. <laughs> Little ham. I started reading and I was like, boy, am I really in trouble. This, this heroin is, is bad, it's bad stuff. So uh, we got him into treatment. We sent him to a White Deer Run in Allenwood and he stayed there for three weeks and he got real sick. Uh, little did I know he was still dope sick but he was pulling my leg and I fell for it and I went down and I picked him up. And uh, he came home, he wasn't even home a day and I think he was out using again. A couple months later, um, Got him back into treatment, got him back home. He started using again. I think that was the first time he overdosed. And uh, he was facing legal problems, so in and out of courts and stuff, and they put him on probation. He overdosed again, and they revoked his probation and put him in jail, and I was like, you know what, something's gotta be done. So I put him in Clearbrook, came home, used again. Then finally came to me and said, Mom, if you don't get me out of here, I'm gonna die. So uh, I talked to his PO and his PO agreed, you know, let's, let's get him out of here, let's send him to Florida. So on August of 2012, put him on a plane off to Florida, he went and he had 16 months clean. He came home in April of 2014 and uh, got using again, this time really, really bad. November, he came to me, Mom, I need to get out of here again. I'm going to die. So on Christmas Day of 2014, he hopped in his truck, loaded his truck up, down 95 south he went, back down to Florida. He was doing really, really good, really good. But that was my last Christmas that I'd ever spend with my son. He came home in May of 2015. And um, that was the last time I seen my son alive. It hurts. I don't, I don't look at these very much. You know, I have pictures on the wall and stuff, and I'll look at the one and tell him good morning or good night, and these I don't get out. Hurts. Yeah, he, he laid there for two and a half, three days dead in his car. 
um, all alone. He died all alone. They got the door open and um, they identified him. He had his driver's license in there and they have identified him by that. Needle in one hand and a bottle of water in the other. My son came home in a body bag. I would say, um, it's sad to say, but we see it in, in my profession. Um, everybody in, uh, in the district attorney's office and all of law enforcement, we're seeing it on a regular basis. I would say it's every week we're seeing that multiple people are dying from overdoses. You know, we see an increase in deaths in Wyoming County, Susquehanna County, I think Wyoming County is actually one of the uh, one of the fourth highest rated um, counties in Pennsylvania for death rate by opioids. Really, Wyoming County. Wyoming County. Wow. You know, Luzerne and Lackawanna County have had tremendous increases. You know, it's not unusual to have a few, maybe five. You know, it's horrible to even talk about it. Seven deaths a weekend or a week. Uh, Pike County uh, is the same thing. Uh, you know, crossing over from Sullivan County, New York, um, and that area is uh, very very common to have five deaths uh, a week. No one is immune from heroin addiction. It transcends all social class, it transcends all families, it transcends to everyone. So no one is immune, no family is immune. So like I said, there's no immunity. I lost my first cousin to an overdose. They threw him out of the car in front of Columbia University, uh, Columbia Medical Center. They threw him out of a car in, at uh, Columbia Medical Center uh, emergency room when I was a young New York City police officer. It destroys families. Drug addiction is hardly a recent phenomenon. This government film from the 1950s highlights the dangers of using drugs like heroin. This is a shooting gallery, a room where addicts come to inject their narcotic and must wait their turn to use the needle. Then all these people are addicts? Some are, some aren't. All will be. For one, it may take five shots, for another, 50. But the narcotic will be master. Today, the opioid crisis blurs all lines among law enforcement, policymakers, mental health professionals, families, and the greater community. Rob Nyhart is radio talk show host on WILK-FM. He also has a personal connection to the crisis. Well, good afternoon once again, everybody. I'm Rob Nyhart sitting in for L.A., the show brought to you by... Last year, his niece passed away from an opioid overdose. Uh, personally, I had a, a niece who was a heroin addict. She fought from the time she was late teens until last year when she died at the age of 32 for, from a, a heroin overdose. And just like any other family that's involved with anybody that's addicted, we thought we did everything we could to help her, as, as families do. Family members, you, you know, you try everything. And so many times in the end, it's, it's just not enough. And you keep asking yourself, you know, what could, I, what could I have done more? And most of the time, the answer is nothing. You've done everything you could. And one day, my husband came home and he said, I believe our son is on heroin. And of course, I, no way. Um, but the traffic coming in and out upstairs at his apartment and the all night thing, the leaving, the constantly wanting money. I was a great enabler. <laughs> sure, here's $20, $20. Why is it always $20, my daughter asked. Mom, that's significant. Oh, I didn't think about that, you know. Okay, well, no, I'll buy the diapers. I'll meet you at the gas station, you know. Well, one day I bought something for his son and I went up to his apartment and I was going down into the kitchen and I caught him washing a bent spoon. And when he whipped his head around at me, all the color went out of his face. And I walked out and I knew that was like, you know, validation. So um, still being in denial, thinking, oh, no, nah, maybe I was seeing things, you know. 
The next morning we went to work, I went in his apartment and searched and I found the needle caps, the toilet paper with blood drops, the bent spoon with the black spot on the bottom, and I was beside myself. I couldn't believe with everything he knew, he still went down that road. And that weekend, I was home. There was people upstairs at his apartment. And I got this gut feeling something was wrong. So I ran up to his apartment. The door was locked. And I heard people scurrying around. And I went to push the door in. And one of his friends opened the door. And there was my son overdosing. And he was screaming. He, when he came to, my mom, he leaped up and grabbed me. And we fell on the floor and he said, I don't want to live. You know, the end result is, you know, this is not the heroine of the 70s when I grew up. You know, there was a certain group that got stuck on that. Like I said, this heroin epidemic has transcended across all lines and all ages and all classes gender, it doesn't matter. So, you know, what is the end result? The end result is either death if you try it. And in most situations, heroin changes the pathways in your brain. Can you maybe explain the process of um, addiction in general and how being addicted to opioids might differ from other types of addictions? There's uh, maybe several ways it differs, but several ways it's the same. You know, uh, the uh, addiction system, I'm not a neurologist, but goes through the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, uh, and it involves epigenetics, where a person has genetic expression. And the um, mesolimbic dopamine pathway, the limbic system is a site, a location of, of appetite, and it's ruthless. And what happens is, is once the addiction goes through that, it's no longer endorphin-based, it's not just like a smile or I did some um, yoga or maybe I did some ceramics. This is something that's, that's very strongly based and it goes through the um, limbic system. It's very appetitive and it's very hard to control. Uh, it's destined, uh, practically destined to cause harm to the person once it goes through that portion of the brain. I w at the end I was shooting heroin and it's an instant euphoria when you shoot it. Um, it's a warm, fuzzy feeling, and um, then you're just last pretty short term. Um, then you're looking for more, and in the meantime, you might get sick, which is terrible, terrible feeling. <laughs> and um, it's kind of just a runaround of, you know. A lot of people are dying. A lot of people, and a lot of people are addicted. So I think one of the major challenges is changing our attitudes towards it. Check these steps for it. Opioid use is so widespread that it takes little effort to find someone affected by the crisis. How's it going? What are you up to? The crew spotted this man sitting under a bridge. He agreed to speak off camera. Really? Really? What made you get off it? How do, how do you feel about it? Like, did it become such a big... Yeah. What do you think the um, solution is, if you don't mind me asking, or, or is there a solution? There's no solution. 
Do you think it's getting better or worse? It's definitely getting worse. Yeah. I still have dreams ten years later. Some argue that Pennsylvania's geographic location itself has amplified the crisis. For Luzerne County, it's our location. Um, we have New York, Philadelphia, New Jersey. Um, it, we are centrally located where all of these individuals are traveling. And then there's distribution cells throughout Pennsylvania, whether it be in Pittsburgh, whether it be in Hazleton, whether it be in you know, Philadelphia or Allentown, regardless, wherever those routes are, there's distribution cells in those areas that then sell the wholesale, the wholesale heroin at $60,000 a kilo. And then that turns into the tray bags of heroin, which is cut to $3 or $5. Do you think there's anything particular about our area that stands out that the rates are so high as they are? The freeways. I don't, yeah. The Jersey, New York, Ohio. Right. We're, we're right here in the middle of, you got your, your major highways coming up, you know. You got Ohio that's getting slammed right now. Um, and it's like, there's Maryland. just like a triangle of, there's certain states in yeah. New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire. And it seems that's where the drugs are running up and down. And so I think that is the biggest issue. We're centrally located. It's a great place to sell drugs. Um, and I have to say, I think it's um, the economic state of our region as well that uh, plays a, a role in all of this. So when you combine all of that, that's what makes it um, a good place to sell drugs. I hate to say it. But not everyone agrees. No, no. no not at all. I think the opioid addiction crosses all social barriers. It doesn't matter if you're a millionaire, a billionaire, or if you're on public assistance. It has hit every social rung on our ladder, period. What's going on in the lack of focus legislatively from all levels of government, from the community, it's, yeah, we need to do something, but nobody's actually doing anything. And that's the frustration that we're in right now. State Representative Coffer takes a personal stance against opioid addiction. Many of his friends have fallen to what's been called the Gray Death. Just in the last month, three or four people that I know that are my age or, or thereabouts, who I know their families from high school or I know their, their families from this area, or know them individually, which were a couple of the kids, um, died. And you know, it's lost it. We just had our 10 year high school reunion. Lost a number of people from my high school class. Now, it might be because of my age, but enough is enough. You know, I had enough of, of going to funerals. I've had enough of getting a, the call from an individual. There's nothing more infuriating to want to do something and not to have the political will from others. As a member of the Pennsylvania General Assembly, he has introduced 10 bills into the legislature in an attempt to combat the problem. Everybody wants to talk about it. Everybody wants to be out there and, yes, we'll put it on a mailer or put it on a TV commercial or, you know, to be at a round table discussing it. But what are you actually doing to follow up on it? And that's the thing that's most infuriating with me. A lot of talk and no action when it comes to this stuff. The fact that the numbers are still growing goes to show you we aren't doing enough or not doing it fast enough. Boy, do I miss him. Him and I spend a lot of time up here. Mm -hmm. 
memories, you know, the good and the bad. Or if I'm, you know, having a bad day, I'll come up and tell them, you know, what, what's going on and ask for guidance. And most of the time, he obliges by that. He tells me what to do. He'll send me signs. My best friend. Ready, guys? You guys are getting soaked. <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> and it's thundering. What do you say, right? What do you say to somebody that comes in who's lost a loved one? I've had it too many times a name. They come in here and they want to do something. They want to help educate the world. They want to help get out there. What can I do to make sure that it's not somebody else's loved one? That's often the, the people who are here. What can I do to help out with this issue? You can try your best but you can never understand what they're going through. Most parents worry, oh my God, they're going to the prom tonight, what if they get in an accident? Or they're going swimming, what if they drown? We, we worry about the floor dropping. We worry about that call, your son overdosed. Uh, the police picked your son up. Um, that's what we live every day. The memories of eight years ago are blank. There's no happy jolly. We did this together. It's painful. Does it seem unfair sometimes? Absolutely. It, it's very unfair. 100% um, yeah. unfair. Yeah. It's a, it's a deep tissued anger, I think, that yeah. us moms and dads have that something that has been going on for generations and decades in this world and no one cared. You know? It is a de epidemic. You know, if we attack this like we attacked AIDS, you know, you hardly ever hear anything about people in America having AIDS. And if they do, uh, they take cocktails. And why did that happen? Because we looked at it as a national epidemic and we said, we have to do something about this. It's a national epidemic. What we have to make sure is we got to start doing more education on this. Uh, you know, early on to kids in school. We got to make sure that we're telling them the real hard and true facts about this so that people stay away from it. If somebody is on it, we got to make sure that we do our best, you know, for these drugs, these maintenance drugs. Uh, you wouldn't take, you know, insulin away from a diabetic. So I'm someone that believes Suboxone works for heroin addicts. Why wouldn't you let them take it like a diabetic takes insulin? Um, why people are saying this is truly an epidemic because we're trying to help, but unless we have treatment, unless we have good programs, unless we get these people the, the soft or hard handoffs that we constantly talk about, we're not going to make a difference. I, I like to keep talking about it, um, sharing my story, helping people, and um, you know, offering what helped me to help other people. Well, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be fixed overnight. There's no doubt about that. Um, it didn't happen overnight. It's not gonna be fixed overnight. And, you know, you look at, you know, over the different decades, you know, it was marijuana, then cocaine, then crack, right? And it kept on evolving over what the new drug was. Well, this opioid issue, I don't think is, is, anywhere near over. What are you going to accomplish by not talking about it? What are you going to accomplish by keeping it um, behind your closed doors? Where are you going to get with that? Absolutely nowhere. 
you need to get out there you need to be a voice you have to stand up you have to get out there and get in faces because this crisis isn't going away anytime too soon was born on the edge street bridge out in the cold muddy water below me in my soul yet yeah, where they left me place I call home Neat the town if I had the solution if anybody actually has the solution they're gonna write a book and make a gazillion dollars hopefully you come up with a solution in this documentary and you could be rich <laughs> seen them let's go up on the hillside what I find is as I talk to people out in the community, somebody has a story, everybody does, about someone. Whether it's a friend or a relative or something. And all you have to do is start the conversation a little bit. And they'll come forward with that information and tell you, yeah, I knew my best friend's daughter or whatever. Stand here waiting. I think just knowing that there, there is hope and there are things that people can do. They can, they can go to rehab, they can use um, many other alternatives too. Like, I mean, I know what was helpful for me was art and meditation and my, being mindful and aware of what I was doing, and I think that's really helpful. Heard the hammers drum on the shore. It's sad to say, but I, on a regular basis, go out and speak to the community, and a lot of people come to me and say, I just want you to lock my child up. So they want their kids to be behind bars because that's the only treatment that they can afford. Um, and so I'm always saying whenever I speak to um, any politicians that we need to find money for programs. And the moon won't shed no light. We are only going to lose more and more and more and fuel crime and lose our population because this could take an entire population out. That's how bad it is. Seen them lights go up on the hillside. Oh no, there's no turning back. I will not turn back. And like I said earlier, I'm in your face. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to stay. Watch my dreams go bound the rail line. Yeah, I'll never. I feel lame no more. Was born on the eight street bridge. Out in the cold. Muddy water below me. Mm -hmm. Cold in my soul.